Good afternoon. It is 2.30. We're right on time. Good afternoon um, and welcome to the uh, Oliver and Adelaide's Humble Foundation collaboration this afternoon. Today's event is brought to you by the Oliver and Adelaide Tumble Foundation in collaboration with APSA. This is an incredibly special year for the Tumble Foundation. Uh, they're celebrating their 10th anniversary. Uh, since their establishment in 2010, this public benefit organization has um, has really been carrying out programs that foster conversations around current day issues affecting South Africans. We have been collaborating, or at least the organization has been collaborating with ABSA for the last five years to develop thought leadership programs that seek to inculcate the tumble values of integrity, selflessness, and ethical leadership, as well as good governance. This partnership has worked because both ABSA and the Tambo Foundation uh, believe that it is critical to share information and stimulate debate that inspires positive action and helps to create a shared future. Now, this is the first in a three-part series of forward-looking webinars that will unpack the real effects of various social ills and how they hinder the inclusive advancement of our country's economy, particularly in the context of our continent. These ills include inequality, gender-based uh, violence, COVID-19, and unethical leadership, amongst others. The aim for this webinar is to contribute towards building a new, more inclusive economy and country that redresses some of the historical structural challenges that have seen South Africa become the most unequal society on earth. My name is Rifilo Moloto. I'm an investment and economic strategist and host of Cape Talk Breakfast with Rifilo Moloto. And uh, welcome to the webinar on digital transformation, the socioeconomic benefits and unintended negative consequences thereof. As we unpack the positive development that is the fourth industrial revolution, uh, we look to, excuse me, uh, we look to, we look at what fourth industrial revolution means for South Africa and Africa. How do we mitigate against the negative consequences? It has also been said that women will be the brunt of digitization followed by the youth. How then do we use technology and digitization to improve the quality of lives of both women and young people? to ensure their inclusion in the growth of the continent's economy. As powerful as each and what each and every one of these topics happens to be, I am not at all the person equipped to necessarily give you that understanding. I'm joined by three auspicious guests this afternoon, and I'm so excited to welcome them in no in particular order except alphabetical, to be fair. Uh, I am excited to welcome Ms. Charmaine Hove. She is Senior Director of Africa for Cisco. Charmaine's love and passion for the ICT industry come from over 26 years of telecommunications experience working with private and public sector across Africa in, uh, in, in, in this particular space. In November 2016, she was named South Africa's top woman in ICT. In August 2017, she was awarded the Ministerial Recognition Award at the MTN Women in ICT Awards in South Africa. She is passionate about working on the continent, collaborating with government, private and public sector, female and community development. She serves on various boards and trusts whose objectives are close to her heart, especially education. Charmaine was recently appointed a member of the invitation only uh, South African chapter of the International Women's Forum of South Africa. She is the co-founder of the Mentorship Circle, a partnership with the uh, African Women Chartered Accountants or ORCA and Duke CE University that mentors young professionals and startups. She mentors girls at Code ZA, an NPO that works with government, private, and public sector to empower young girls seeking a long-term career in ICT by teaching girls in rural areas how to code and design. A game changer, if you heard of one. Charmaine Hove, welcome to uh, this uh, wonderful webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Rafil Bey. Thank you. Of course. Our second uh, panelist today uh, that will that we'll be hearing from is Professor Chilitzi Marwala. He's the Vice Chancellor of the University of Johannesburg. Chilitzi is the uh, principal also of the university and has done so since the 1st of January 2018. From 2003 to 2008, he held the positions of Associate Professor, Full Professor, the Carl and Emily Fuchs Chair of Systems and Control Engineering, as well as the Saatchi Chair of Systems Engineering at the Department of Electrical and Information Engineering 
at the University of Witwatersrand. From 2001 to 2003, he was executive assistant to the technical director at South African breweries. And in the year preceding that, he was a postdoctoral research associate at Imperial College, back then known as the University of London. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering, magna cum laude, excuse us, from Case Western Reserve University in the USA in 95, a Master of Mechanical Engineering from the University of Pretoria in 97, and a PhD specializing in artificial intelligence and engineering from the University of Cambridge in 2000. He is a registered professional engineer, a fellow of TWAS, the World Academy of Sciences, the Academy of Science South Africa, the African Academy of Sciences and the South African Academy of Engineering. He is a senior member of the IEEE, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineering, and a distinguished member of the ACM, the Association for Computing Machinery. His research interests are multidisciplinary, and they include the theory and application of artificial intelligence to engineering, computer science, finance, social science, and medicine. He's published, <laughs> pause for it, 14 books, 14 books on artificial intelligence, over 300 papers in journals, proceedings, book chapters and magazines, and he holds four patents. He is an associate editor of the Interna International Journal of System Science, Taylor and Francis Publishers. He has received more than 45 awards, including the Order of Mapungubwe, and was a delegate to the 1989 London International Youth Science Fortnight, Lysif, Lysif, when he was in high school. He has also been appointed as deputy chair of the Presidential Commission of the Fourth Industrial Revolution. A mouthful of teeth I have at this particular moment. Professor, welcome uh, to this auspicious uh, discussion. Thank you so much for joining us. No, th thank you very much, uh, Anifile, and uh, I'm looking forward to the engagement. Likewise, I hope I can keep up. Our third and final guest, Ms. Loisi Wali, is head of venture, Founders Factory. Uh, Loisi is responsible for sourcing, selecting, and qualifying the startups that join Founders Factory's scale program. She is a 2019 Obama Africa leader and two-time early stage tech founder who's passionate about building products that sit at the intersection of economic science, impact, and technology. Rosie started her career in the US at one of the top three aerospace and future tech manufacturers in the world, where she led transcontinental campaigns and managed a portfolio size of 3 billion US dollars. She brings several years of international and pan-African experience in impact investing and innovative finance and was the first African graduate, uh, sorry, first African to graduate from the prestigious IIX Global Impact Investment Exchange Impact Institute in Singapore in 2016. She later founded IIX Global South Africa chapter, mobilizing both private and public sector commitments to structure Africa's first women's livelihood impact bond. In 2018, she founded Her HQ, Africa's first digital social capital market, democratizing access to knowledge, capital, and markets for pan-African female founders of color. Razi is obsessed with all things startups. I mean, I'm already obsessed with her. She is already also a relentless pro-African futurist and a women's rights activist. Razi, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank, Hi, you, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Looking forward to it as well. Likewise. Okay, so here's, here's the, the wonderful thing about today's discussion. You are all incredibly well-versed, well-educated, trained and experienced people within the ICT sector uh, and in the, the STEM sector, um, more so than maybe some of our politicians who have battled to actually frame when they speak about the policy of fourth industrial revolution. So my opening question for today's panel, I would like each of you to take me through your definition and understanding of the term fourth industrial revolution, particularly as it pertains to Africa. Razi, since I ended with you, I'll kick off with you. Great, thank you so much, um, Rafila. And, and it's it's such a tiny topic as well, and a, and a term that's so um, loosely used. And and I'll try my best to give my idea of what it is, um, given the company that I'm in. Um, so I think the way that I think about the fourth industrial revolution is really looking at it from this progression from sort of linear technology to what we think of as more exponential um, technology. And so this idea of um, you know, hyper-connected societies leveraging technology across, um, you know, various fields that have allowed for a tremendous amount of access, speed, 
um, and just hyper connectivity across AI, Internet of Things. And so it's really, I think for me, synthesizing this notion of, of more exponential tech and hyper connectedness across the, the globe that I think we haven't seen up until now. Excellent. Um, that's that's a that's a really great. Okay, so exponential growth, and and for you, Professor, where would you say? How would you say you describe uh, fourth industrial revolution? And again, in, in terms of the impact on Africa. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think all uh, industrial revolutions are really about technology. Uh, the nature of the technology that we have today, as opposed to the steam engine or electricity or electronics is that it is becoming intelligent. It is actually able to reflect us, we can talk to it. And because of that, it is actually disrupting uh, us as human beings, uh, something as fundamental as our identities uh, uh, are being challenged because of the fourth industrial revolution. So it's really about bringing more, uh, uh, more intelligence, uh, bringing more connectivity uh, to us and to our production, and to the world. Right. And finally to you, Charmaine, uh, what does the term fourth industrial revolution mean to you? So, so it's very interesting, um, Rafael, where when the professor and I were actually um, debating this very definition with the Presidential Fourth Industrial Revolution Commission, um, consisting of all of us commissioners, um, I think exactly what we had agreed was, I think as Prof touched on it, suddenly we are seeing the real blurring of these different boundaries. And I think we settled on the definition that we can definitely see that um, for our, um, as taken from, press, um, from Professor Schwab's definition of the fourth industrial revolution, it really is the blurring of these boundaries between um, the biological, the digital and the physical worlds. And I think Previously, um, we saw that technologies like AI, the Internet of Things, 3D printing, um, you know, robotics were used in isolation. And I think for the first time today, we're seeing that 4 um, delivers socio and economic benefits through fusing together the fusion of all of these technologies, where for the first time you can actually do something like remote patient testing. So there is that intelligence, finally, that doctors don't need to actually go in and see a patient physically, the doctor can actually start testing for results um, remotely. And I think this is the remarkable world that starts to bring together that reality um, of a true dig digitalized, um, I think, society with real benefits for citizens, for the state, and of course, for businesses as well. All right, so we sit in awe of all three of your perspectives, but I'm also going to give the opportunity to our audience to challenge or provide their own perspectives of 4IR. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we won't be using the chat function, but if you are, if you have some questions to put forward, please don't wait until the end of the actual presentation and the discussion. Please send them through on the Q&A function. Uh, I'll be keeping an eye on that and would love to hear from you and pose these to each of our guests and or just throw them into the mix for our discussion. And of course, if you are having these conversations, for example, on Twitter or any other social networks, do feel free to use the handle for today's event, which is at Tumble Foundation and the hashtag Tumble Webinar Series. While we wait for some of those perspectives, I'll kick off with one little challenge, only to say, I love each and every one of these definitions. We're moving exponential from linear. We're making sure it's about technology and the fact that um, uh, technology needs to now be intelligent. We are able to mix biological, physical, uh, and digital uh, worlds at this particular time. And yet, to me, Africa seems to be in a pretty rudimentary space for the majority. Um, I feel as though we haven't actually they speak of leapfrogging, but I'm not sure we fully embraced the third industrial, industrial revolution. How is it that the four of us sit here on this webinar, uh, and I believe that the majority of South Africa is not here? In this, for example, in a COVID world where we need to access one another digitally, how do we how do we bridge that divide, Charmaine? So, um, you know, I think the professor will touch on some of the eight recommendations that actually came out from the presidential task team. Um, where we were actually recommending a few things. But I think I'm just going to take a step back again and I think focus on um, in 2016 in Rwanda when Professor Schwab first announced the fourth industrial revolution, I was actually in, in the audience where he said 
that there are many things that are going to change and it will either be a time of great promise or I think for the continent, a time of great peril, simply because so many of those foundational aspects that need to be there are actually not present. So things like ensuring that the cost of data um, is actually one that can start to get us better connectivity. I know that for ages we've been having debates probably going on over a decade now around the fact that we need access to high demand spectrum. Something that comes up consistently again, time and time again, comes around the educational foundation from early childhood development all the way through to TVET colleges and qualifications and ensuring that a lot of graduates who come out of this are actually school ready. But I think something that stuck in my mind that the professor indicated was that for us to ensure that we actually obtain the full benefits of, of embracing or enabling this for IR um, you know, um, concept has to be a better collaboration and a better partnership between government, between academia, between civil society, between individuals, and of course, between corporates. And I think for me, that's where a lot of the missing foundations actually need to come together from government, ensuring that you know they create more of a focus on SMMEs and ensure that these SMMEs are actually funded, especially where there is agro-processing involved or advanced manufacturing involved, um, to ensure that we start to bolster the economy all the way through to ensuring that schools are taught the right life skills around complexity, teamwork, but also I think quite critically around in a, enabling, I think, STEMI. And I know before we spoke a lot about STEM, but now we've added in the arts and we've added in innovation as well. And I think embracing that, ensuring we look at that is quite crucial as well. But I think, you know, not just looking at it from a government perspective, I think we also move across to business who has to rethink strategies around workplace and how we work. And I think COVID has dramatically changed um, how we work, how we learn, how we live, how we play. And I think also governments ensuring that they write skill because suddenly now we're finding out that a lot of, of, of graduates who thought they had a job for life, that's really not the case. And I think also preparing again for the advent of a lot of jobs that are going to be lost, but also the new jobs that are coming require a particular type of skill. So I think it's quite important um, I think if you were for all of these different entities to work together to ensure that we start to address um, this digital divide that's been prevalent for a long period of time. And there are some real regulatory aspects and also policy aspects that need to be amended with the immediate effect. All right. Um, so we, we happen to be lucky enough to have two of those participants uh, in that discussion. Uh, the academic space, as well as the venture capital and the business space. You were speaking about SMMEs. Um, so I'm going to kick off with you, Professor uh, Chilitzi. Won't you tell us um, about these aid recommendations, seeing as Charmaine has pointed towards them? Can you highlight some of those that might bridge the divide that I mentioned a little earlier? Yeah, absolutely. I think the issue of, uh, of investing in human capacity development, particularly in the skills of uh, the fourth industrial revolution, whether it is... Uh, artificial intelligence, whether it is blockchain, whether it is internet of things, is very crucial. We have a great deal of people uh, in their mid-careers who were just simply not trained for these technologies. So adult-based education is no longer just about teaching people how to write, read and write. It's about teaching them how to become technologically literate. Then the second aspect is really about infrastructure. You know, uh, if you have people and, you, and they're well-trained, they understand these technologies, if, if, if the infrastructure is not correct, then they are not going to be able to participate in that. And obviously things such as spectrum, very, very important because as we move into the 5G, uh, faster connectivity, what we need is actually spectrum. And we have not issued spectrum for the past 15 years. And many other key infrastructure. Then there is the issue of data. I think there is an expression that, uh, uh, that data is the new oil. Now, if data is the new oil, what are we doing about it? Uh, and by the way, Facebook, Twitter, and Google are mining this oil. They are drilling this oil every day in South Africa and using it to make money. You know, uh, The regulatory perspective comes into the picture. How do we regulate this? But how do we make our vast data available and secure. For example, if, if we could just make all the X-ray images that government actually takes in public hospitals available to innovators, 
They can easily build an AI application which you can show it a picture of uh, an X-ray image and it will actually be able to tell you uh, diagnose even much better than a human being. So those are very, very uh, crucial, but it is also about technology. So we need to invest in artificial intelligence. Uh, it is actually quite interesting that here in South Africa, we, we have drafted the fourth industrial revolution strategies. If you look at what the rest of the world is doing, they are actually paying particular attention to artificial intelligence. You know, uh, whether it is in, in Europe, whether it is in, in, in Asia, in China, for example, uh, the United States has just unveiled their AI institutes that they are going to promote in the United States. So it's about investing in these key technologies. We have actually been users of technologies. Where in the value chain can we be participants? Most of these algorithms are available for free. Google actually gives you um, all artificial intelligence uh, algorithms for free. The issue is how do we mobilize the people now who understand technology, the infrastructure, so that we can build applications that solve real problems. I love this. I love this perspective, but I'm still struggling to put it into the South African context. So most recently, our own president has highlighted the priorities for industry to be mining and I suppose the electrification, which still relies on coal. Um, I'm not sure yet that we speak the language that Charmaine and Chilizi, you are putting forward to us. I'm not sure that in Africa and in South Africa in particular, uh, while we are still trying to get people educated in the most basic language of the second industrial revolution, that we're ready to speak this language. And Razi, I'd like to give this to you to help us understand how you're trying to get us adept at this langua franca. Um, how do you in intervene here uh, with respect to infrastructure and getting us actually to understand how, how to deliver this? Yeah, no, I think that's such a great question, Rufilo, and I, and I think both the professor and Charmaine touched on some critical points in terms of obviously the systemic part of this problem, right, that speaks to infrastructure, education, um, you know, government and regulation support to sort of drive this agenda and make sure that it's a holistic um, solution set. But I think for me, where I could probably, you know, add some color to to the other side of that and, and sort of the industry that I'm in, which is sort of venture capital and, and working with startups um, across, you know, the continent. We're based in South Africa, but we have a mandate to build and scale about 140 tech startups across the continent. And so we see incredible volume of founders and technological solutions across health tech and fintech and a variety of sectors coming through through the door. And I think for me, the first thing I would highlight around some of this is, is really, you know, putting a call out to industries like venture capital and, and also putting, you know, some pressure on the government to make it easier for money to move and for startups to exist, right? Because when you even look at, you know, the most progressive economies, be it in the US or, or other, you know, the private sector, the startups, the, the sort of youth drive technology and they drive progression. And you then always have this sort of cat and mouse race where they go and create all of these things and you have the SECs and the government always trying to catch up and regulate it after the fact. And in some cases, you know, it's obviously not the most optimal, but I think in other ways it pushes societies forward. And so for me, I think the one area that I would really encourage is around saying, how do we really start to foster an ecosystem for startups and, and innovation to thrive and also to fail, right? There, the opportunity cost of a startup and, and, and innovation in South Africa and on the continent is still too high, in my opinion. Um, when you look at the US and, and markets where this has progressed quite strongly, you'll find that there are various instruments at that front end of that funnel that sort of irrigate pipeline and irrigate innovation and failure and, and back and forth. And, and for, here, for us here, the flow of capital and access is still so um, exclusionary, if you will. And I think there's a level of our thinking about how can we sort of leverage technology to, to democratize access, right? Democratize access to sort of knowledge, democratize access to capital, democratize access to markets and visibility, right? There are an incredible amount of solutions um, that founders and startups are doing. For example, the professor touched on the use of AI for you know, health and triage and diagnostics. And we've got a startup that's come through 
our program, you know, a South African startup where she's built an incredible AI platform to help diagnose sort of image diagnostics using AI. Obviously, AI takes time and you've got to train the model and it gets smarter over time. But I think the technology is there, the minds and the talent are here, African founders and the youth here are absolutely incredible. I think the thing we lack and the thing that I think we need to move this conversation forward is the ability for that flow of capital and the sort of legislative sandboxes that allow that innovation to take place. Okay, the opportunity to fail, greater risk appetite. Um, you've got a pan-African perspective, Lazi. Um, if I look at late 2019 numbers, uh, tech hubs that have been developing, Nigeria leads around 85. Uh, South Africa, not far behind. Egypt, Kenya, right up there, just around 50. Um, just to understand, I think there's a, there's a little bit of a race to be the Silicon Valley in, on the continent. South Africa likes to think we've got Silicon Cape. Kenya speaks of Silicon Savannah. Um, what is your understanding of the user-led development of the fourth industrial revolution which you're saying is so important uh, in South Africa as compared to our African counterparts? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So I think the first thing I, I sort of want to address because I hear this used so much and I, don't, and I know it's not designed to be in any sort of um, malicious way in any way, but I think for me the idea of even using terms like Silicon Cape or Silicon anything as aspirational for African founders, I think is a problem. Um, I think when you understand why places like Silicon Valley existed, right, they existed to actually solve indigenous problems for the US. It was a partnership between sort of your Stanford University and the local tech ecosystem and, and actually building solutions that were solving pertinent problems for that market and that ecosystem. I think to, to Professor's point earlier about, you know, using technology to solve real problems. So I think that's the first thing is that I think the lens we're applying and the sort of aspiration around replicating what was done in silicone, whatever here, I think is the first problem we've created. And I, I say we, because I'm part of that industry as well. And so I think to, to address your point, I think, you know, in the work that we do, we are big fans of sort of human centered design and user um, focused design and user focused product builds, right? And I think, and I think that's the solutions that you see succeed and scale, right? As African people, we are from here, we live here, we know our problems, we know how the nuances of how things work. And, and so I think for me, to my earlier point around building an ecosystem where capital supports those type of founders who understand the problems, might not have the resources to build for it, and helping them actually build solutions and leverage technology to, to build Afrocentric solutions. And I think that's when we're going to see scale. And I think that's when we're going to see innovation move from here to the rest of the world and not necessarily always the rest of the world coming back this way. The innovation may come from here, Loisy, but I want to challenge you here. The, the capital tends to come from there. Yeah. So one of the biggest vectors of capital uh, driving toward Africa in tech has come from Silicon Valley. They found themselves plateauing on their growth numbers. So Africa is this enormous continent with so many users who are able to leapfrog with so many African solutions to solve and brilliant innovators. Uh, so money does get channeled here. And so unfortunately, you can't completely ignore them. And, and maybe I guess what I'm trying what I'm trying to get a sense of from you is while I appreciate that it's not for us to look at the rest of the world for solutions to our problems. To some extent, capital is a great problem to solve. We heard yeah. just from Professor, he, he indicated who is, is investing in the data mining uh, race. It is Facebook, it is Google, to the extent that, as you were talking about just now, even regulators have to catch up. Maybe yeah. um, you help us understand how, how we balance the power. Uh, and then I wanna turn to some questions from our, our audience. Absolutely. And, and I think I want to make sure I, I clarify the point that it's definitely not saying let's ignore the West and, and capital inflow. I mean, when you look at even our own fiscal structure, our loan structure, you know, there's a lot more money that we, we depend on on external um, sources to, to support that. So I think there's a, a different conversation around the identity of capital and, and the incentives that that actually builds in terms of the industries that come about. Right. Because I think there is a misalignment there as well. But I think to to go ahead. Sorry, no, I was saying, just gonna go ahead, please. No, I was, I was saying for me, I think it's really important then to to make sure that 
even though Western capital is important and we rely on it, it's also incumbent upon our own people in Africa, the wealthiest of our own individuals here to drive capital towards indigenous ideas. Because the problem that you have is because we're not seeing a lot of that local and, and government investment into this type of technology, majority of African founders are going to US investors to build and, and raise capital, which then also informs bias in what they end up building. Because Facebook is not here just investing and, and putting money towards data mining to, to be nice to us. It's, it's a very strategically you know, aligned mission. They often say, if, if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. And so you, you've got to then think about what the incentive structures around that and, and figuring out ways that how can we as Africans you know, build indigenous economies, whether it's capital and product as well. Absolutely. Charmaine, uh, you come from a big international firm as Cisco. Um, what are the risks that uh, much of the investment that is happening in African startups or in African tech by the big players like the ones that Chilita mentioned um, is a risk of actually a pipeline that is a, an extractive pipeline, very similar to oil. It's interesting that the example that the professor used was describing data as oil. Who, are we just a source of this resource? It's pumped out to other markets. How do we prevent that? So, yeah, you know, I think um, just to go back to what Loazi is saying, and she's absolutely spot on, right? I think because locally, we have not produced that urgency um, around true technocrats and for us to want to actually solve local challenges. So we find again that a lot of the leads who are starting to go back to the townships, you know, associations like Girl Code, I Am The Code, Geek Culture, and so many other amazing associations who actually go back to rural areas to actually train young girls, train young boys, to actually start to get their um, about the world of tech. We actually don't have enough mentors. I think we don't have enough sponsors and coaches um, who look like us and who speak like us and who have similar journeys to go back and say, here is a real challenge in my particular township and therefore here's how I'm going to solve that with the right influence and I think the right people to actually help work with me to solve that. So instead we find that even like a, an association I'm very close to for a number of years, like Girl Code, we support them through my organization, in my personal capacity, through hackathons, through um, visits over abroad to Silicon Valley, to various other companies where and, and countries where we know that tech is leading Again, we find that we're losing so many, so many of these individuals that we train locally, that we invest in um, quite significantly as well, and that we actually try to prepare to stay here. Again, I think the challenges and frustrations that Loazi articulated so well around getting that right amount of support, the funding, the ecosystem, that nurturing infrastructure, and also that nurturing team to keep them here is a real challenge for companies like us. Um, so again, you know, we often find that because we still have this myth that the fourth industrial revolution is coming, um, we're forgetting that in fact, it's on in full swing in many organizations, if anything, I think that many companies in South Africa have been quite polite in terms of toning it down simply because we understand that already employment fights against this country and therefore we cannot be irresponsible and go out and automatically automate everything. So again, I think I keep coming back to the importance of this consultation between an ecosystem of stakeholders to ensure that the both industrial revolution is actually enabled in a very responsible manner. And I think again, understanding and knowing the crisis that we sit with right now in terms of skills development, in terms of education, um, again, we keep having to take a step back and ensure that the right people are actually driving um, the full 4IR technology. But I, I, I don't believe that there is a shortage in terms of um, people ready youth who want to go out there. But I think, again, what is lacking are the right mentors, the right coaches, the right sponsors to ensure that the funding is made available, that the right um, sort of sectors are being targeted, and again, that the right processes are in place to ensure that these developments actually stay in South Africa and we're not losing such a significant amount of skill to our companies abroad. And that, that is an unintended consequence, which we do want to touch on today. There's a question that's come through from one of our audience. Um, I'm not the expert here, so I'll allow one of the three of you to, to volunteer to disabuse this perspective. The question is, is technology advancement at the risk of human life? Is it through the 5G, is, is it through that 5G that causes cancer through radiation emission? 
And perhaps there are two parts to this question. I mean, there may be human life, I think, Charmaine, and what you were speaking about with respect to job security, um, automation that actually excludes us from participation. And then there's what seems to be bordering on a conspiracy theory. So I will, I, I'm, I will leave it to you, Charmaine. Otherwise, Professor, you spoke very emphatically about technology. I'm happy for you to take this one as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, uh, technology, we always have to evaluate whether it is safe or not. But I can assure you 5G is not, uh, it's not dangerous. It's more of a conspiracy than anything else. But it is clear that technology is, is, is actually changing the nature of our economy. Uh, the nature of employment is actually changing right in front of our eyes. And there is nothing that we can do to stop that because it is about being competitive. If you do not adopt those robots, even the people that you are trying to prevent uh, them from losing the jobs will not have the jobs because simply that company will close because it will not be competitive enough. So it is important for us to understand that it is really about competition and we cannot afford not to be competitive. If we become uncompetitive, even things such as uh, uh, dealing with issues of unemployment through uh, a universal basic income will not be possible because you just will not have enough uh, taxes to be able to support them. And then there is the second issue about the dangers of automation. You know, uh, will artificial intelligence uh, conspire against us and, 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 and conspire to eliminate us? The answer is no. Uh, it is very clear that uh, the intelligence that we have built is very specific. Yes, Deep Blue or any other computer can play chess better than a human being, but it cannot cook better than a human being. It cannot be able to console a human being uh, uh, better than a human being. So artificial general uh, intelligence is far from us. Um, these technologies that are available are will not conspire against us. Yes, they are, can do things better than us. And what we need to do is to say, what is the role of human beings uh, in this e ecosystem? It's clear that uh, um, if there are new roles that are going to emerge. It is clear that there are existing roles that are actually going to change and it will require us to adapt to those changes. But it is also clear that many of the roles that exist today are just going to simply disappear and people who are doing those roles will have all sorts of other psychological issues that we need to deal with. It. I think let us deal with these issues. Let us not worry too much about the fact that we are having problems with the distribution of electricity. In fact, we are supposed to use these technologies in order for us to secure our electricity. You know, I think about some... I feel where maybe just yes, to what Prof is saying as well, which I think is like real life case studies, right? It's not, it's not stuff that we're thinking will come again. I'm going to keep coming back to the fact that I think already a lot of these case studies of the new jobs are out there. Something which I found fascinating last year when I was in Silicon Valley was I saw an advert for somebody to go and walk somebody's iPhone to play Pokemon Go. So we know that a lot of executives are in back-to-back -back meetings and Pokemon Go is one of these crazy, um, you know, games that are out there. And somebody was looking for people who would walk their, their iPhone while they were in meetings and they were paying some pretty good rates. So these are the examples of the new jobs that come in. And McKinsey also, you know, launched a very interesting report um, that was written by Norm Fanelo Maguenchu and her colleagues around the fact that there is this 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 um, for our technology and digitalization has the ability to bring in 1.6 million new jobs, specifically just for women, though, for women. If we start to look at um, the roles of ensuring that, you know, women are better fit into um, the gender parity, diverse roles in the environment, an additional 1.7 million jobs just for graduates in ICT roles, um, provided, of course, again, that these policies were clearly outlined and we don't have the current challenges of the women in Cape Town who came up with the e-hailing solution, thereby growing the economy, and everyone else said, no, we don't want it because we want our traditional roles. I think to the professor's point, you know, if we want to be competitive, we're going to have to start embracing these roles. Like during lockdown, my 11-year-old found a very clever way of actually teaching other kids how to um, enhance their sniper activities in Fortnite. And he came up with a few videos and was charging X amount of dollars 
for the viewing of these videos. And I think he has been paid $10 per two minute video to show people how to enhance their sniper tactics. You know, and I think these are, are, are the new jobs that the younger generations are actually exploring again through to, uh, for IR. And there are some phenomenal examples out there. Again, you know, I think there is the danger and the risk of us saying, oh no, but that's not a real job. And oh my goodness, how can you, your 11 year old be online teaching people how to excel in Fortnite, et cetera. But this is the reality. Of, of what's actually coming in terms of new jobs in the automation that is actually going to be valued so that we give meaningful jobs to people and not the repetitive monotonous tasks that we are all trying to actually get away from. Okay, so I like this. So Charmaine, you're excited about this new world of jobs. Loise is clearly very excited about this user and developer and innovator led world of jobs. Your point about not keeping it monotonous, I don't want to have to move from being a great picker to a Pokemon walker with respect to that job offer. I also want to be at the forefront of innovation. And so I'm going to take this back to Prof. Prof, your job is as an educator. How are you preparing South Africa as an educator, as vice chancellor of UJ for taking on these roles, for making them not seem like, you know, not great roles, like, like Charmaine was saying, people mustn't, mustn't sort of look down their nose at the new world of roles. And, and, and with that, as success stories of competition go, I'd like to just add Shaista Ahmad's question that's come through here on the Q&A line. And please all keep yours coming through, saying, to Chilitzi's point about being participants and not just users of tech, tech, are mobile money systems an example of this? Maybe is that something that might help answer your question? No, thank you very much. Obvious, it is clear that the skill sets that we required in the previous industrial uh, are not going to work. It is clear that the idea of specialization uh, is, not, is not necessarily as valuable as it is now. Generalists are now required, as you can see with Elon Musk. Now, uh, how do, what do we do with, with edu well, what do we do as educators? One of the first things that we have done is to say that all our students, irrespective of what they are studying, must actually take a course in artificial intelligence. Yes, we are not teaching them how to program in Python. We are not treating, teaching them uh, what deep learning neural network is all about. What we are teaching them is about the technology, what it can do, uh, how has it been applied, what are some of the dangers, so that they can be educated about it. Because many of these people, they will be in a room where decisions will have to be made about these uh, technologies. Uh, secondly, education must become multidisciplinary. I can't emphasize this enough. The fact that Germany, a highly technological country, seems to be lagging behind in these new types of technologies that have emerged over the last few years is because they have been training mechanical engineers and electrical engineers very, very well. They have not been training uh, people who understand so social science, who understand uh, humanities. For example, when I was an undergraduate student in North America, I was told, you are doing mechanical engineering, but you have to take 12 semesters of human and social science. And of course, somebody who is educated uh, on understanding society and technology probably is more likely to create a social network company. Uh, than somebody who was trained very well to become a computer programmer. So indeed, it's very, very important that uh, uh, we do this. Now, what will be the catalyst? What are, is it mobile money? What will, what is that thing that we need in order to, uh, to actually move forward? Unfortunately, uh, uh, you know, which is really sad for South Africa, some of the most influential algorithms in AI were actually discovered here. You know, Gaussian mixture models, which is absolutely uh, one of the leading types of AI, was invented at that university. You know, uh, uh, not even 10 years ago, uh, almost 40 years ago, you know. So what we need to do is to acknowledge that South Africa actually had huge capacity. We actually have an ecosystem that can actually work. What we need to do is to prevent uh, the osmotic loss of some of the critical people that we need, the critical technologies that we require, and so on and so forth. And, and, and lastly, we need to teach our people to understand 
the problems around them because the solutions of the future are going to emerge by us understanding the problems in the African continent. Before COVID, we used to have Africa, Africa Innovation by Bus, where we were taking our students to, uh, to this year we were supposed to take them to Kigali, last year we took them to Zambia, and we said, look around, look for problems, and tell us the solutions that you're going to deploy, very, very important in education for the future. All right, Chilitza, but now your whole point about so much being developed in South Africa and not actually still residing in South Africa brings two issues, one of which is addressed by the question. The first is the earlier question we dealt with with Lazi regarding capital. So he who has, he who has the, the gold decides the golden rule. And the second is a question that's brought to us by Clifford Hill, who asks, um, with geopolitical co going concerns such as Brexit and the US Sino trade war, Countries are compelled to pick a side where IP and collaboration are concerned. How best can we mitigate the risk to innovation more urgently in developing countries which are relegated to being the receiver of leading countries' agenda? Um, no, no, actually, no, but I'd love to hear from Lazi as well. Yeah. Okay, then maybe let me just talk about this. Here in South Africa, we talk about something called the National System of Innovation which is universities, CSIR, NRF, and whatever uh, uh, companies that are doing. And that is the wrong way of framing this, this thing. It's an, it's an ecosystem of innovation. It cannot be a closed ecosystem of innovation. Silicon Valley is not closed. Some of the biggest investors are not even American. You know? China is a big investor in Silicon Valley. You know? So we need to open up. And I think if we actually, because one thing that is that is good about this, the era in which we are, is that you don't need to build huge refineries in order for you to be in the game. So the barriers of entry are actually much lower than you think. The people who created Twitter is not a, a huge refinery with thousands of people. It was probably less than, it was actually less than a thousand people. So I can tell you, if we put our minds to it, this is an era where we can be able to insert ourselves and be able to make the breakthrough that we couldn't make in the era that required huge amounts of physical capital. Lwazi, it is your role at Founders Factory and through Founders Factory Scale to do exactly this. Uh, how, have you had, how have you made it work? Um, so, can I... Clarify which question, is it the, the one from the user or which one would you like? So, um, Professor started answering the question from the user about how we, we drive our IP, I suppose, control in a world where the yeah. agenda is not necessarily led by us. And I'm yes. wondering if you can use some examples through your work with Founders Factory and Scale of building these non-giant refineries and actually making sure we influence the agenda. Absolutely. Yeah, so I think, you know, to the professor's point, and I think he touches on a very important point around one sort of the humanization of technology, right? It's, and I think people like to think of technology as this other that just shows up on its own and it's come to get us all and, and you know, we have no control over it. It's actually when you think about, you know, technology and algorithms, they're sort of, right, opinions embedded in code, right? It's somebody's opinion, it's somebody's point of view and somebody's solution set embedded in some sort of algorithm that then gets smarter and, 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 and progresses that way. So I think the first thing to really unpack is, is, is you can't really touch on the scale potential of technology without touching on the systemic impediments to their existence, right? And I, I think the first one obviously being capital, but I think also in, in the context of South Africa, for example, it's, it's still very hard to build something here and get it out of South Africa. I mean, when we look at you know, a lot of the founders that we work with, for example, you know, we're engaging lawyers around them trying to figure out how to register their IP and tech in, in more, you know, malleable sort of SPV vehicles, whether that's in Mauritius or Bahamas or other jurisdictions. Um, that obviously is a way of sort of bringing and, and, and technology and, and innovation leaving the country. So I think for me, there's a first, there's a really important bucket around the legislative and, and sort of regulatory environment that's been created by our own government and the humans that exist in this in, in the country, right? And I think once that's addressed, 
potentially we could start to see more of that flow. And I think you'll see it evidence now in, in, you know, women, for example, women founders are starting businesses faster than anybody else, um, not only globally, up to about 19, 20%, but also in Africa is leading the way, actually. And you look at who's leading in, in those spaces, it's in countries like Senegal and others who are now creating really interesting, you know, startup sandboxes that really make it easy and incentivize founders from all over the world to come into that country and actually build technology and, and startups in that space. So for me, I think there's a really big, important um, point around just the environment that we create as a country to foster this type of innovation. And then I think, secondly, there, there is great opportunity in, 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 in technology, right? I think we are sat in, in South Africa, but we work with we are now seeing through our own portfolio startups that are South African partnering with Ghanaian and Nigerian and you know Kenyan founders who are not only becoming you know value chain partners but now customers that they're all meeting through this network. And I think this this notion of also transitioning from this idea of there is Africa and then there's South Africa as if we're not part of the same continent. And and I think that's a paradigm shift that is really critical to move. And I think once we can get a sense of those, you know, real, you know, paradigms that exist that sort of create blocks, we can then really start to take advantage of technology, right? Because the cool thing about technology is the fact that it's borderless. It doesn't require, to, to the professor's point, it's not some big, you know, sort of um, huge investment of infrastructure and brick and mortar. You can actually transcend borders and you're seeing founders do it anyway. And I think for me, the call to action is to say, you know, our governments and, and the people who actually define the rule set around it should really come to the table because I think what's happening in the era of blockchain and cryptocurrency and other sort of channels that are independent of regulation to some extent, these founders are doing it anyway, um, whether we are part of it or we are allowing them to. And I think if we can actually come to the table and work together as two separate ecosystems, I think there's opportunity for, for progression there. I mean, I don't know if it's an exercise in a comedy or terror just to watch one Senate hearing with the group, the, the top five yeah. tech CEOs and the senators. I'm not sure our yeah. government is ready for that kind of Q&A. Um, okay. But, but, okay, go ahead. No, I was going to say, but if, if we can't exactly afford to ignore it, right, and we can't afford we to, can't. to yeah. be afraid of it anymore, these companies are more powerful and more wealthy than, you know, most of... The, the Dow Jones on, on the stock exchange. I mean, these are actual entities that now have to be, you know, regulated. I mean, now we're talking about the regulation of AI as an entity, and maybe I'd love to have an understanding of that from the professor, but because they're evolving so much faster and they're taking up such actual landscape and, and footprint that we have to be really, you know, focused about making sure that we're understanding and we're participating at the same rate, otherwise it will go away from us. And, and I think that's going to be an even harder conversation to have. I want to take this conversation towards those social impacts as we close out. We've only got a few minutes left, but um, as particularly with the questions that have come forth, you've spoken about the humanization of tech. Professor has spoken about how it needs to be integrated with our lives. Charmaine has highlighted uh, the exclusionary or the inclusionary priorities, particularly around gender. So let's, let's kick off with a couple of questions here. Natasha Ali asking, uh, how can we use technology and innovation to improve access to mental health resources? Um, you know, we, we've seen the impacts through that show, the social dilemma and how it can actually tarnish mental health. Uh, how do we use it for good? Uh, who mm -hmm. would like to tackle that? Charmaine, Professor? No, I, th I think I can take it. I mean, any technology uh, uh, will have good and bad. You know about nuclear technology giving us electricity, but it can be used as a and what is happening with these technologies is because it is changing our psychology. And some people even think that uh, our addiction to social media uh, software is very similar to addiction to drugs. You know? So what do we do about it? I think firstly, we need to understand scientifically what is actually happening. Here in Johannesburg, what is the impact of, of Facebook on the behavior of people. What is the impact of technology on behavior? We need to understand that. Once we understand that, then we have to, to start thinking about some regulatory framework. 
and you have talked, you have you have put it very well. You know, our 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 lawmakers must become technologically literate. We need to teach them about technology. They they do not understand technology, and it's not just here; it's also uh, in the United States. And then finally, I think the issue of governance of technology is very very important. I am in a committee in the World Health Organization that has realized that in medicine, there are lots of decisions now that are being made by human beings and machines. And you don't even know who is responsible for the consequences of those decisions. How do you regulate that? And it's not just the technology itself. It starts with the data itself. The person who collects the data, is the data comprehensive enough? Because it is not comprehensive, that face recognition algorithm will discriminate against people who are not well represented in the data sample. It is about the person who actually trained, the engineer who trained the machine. It's about the user who, take that, who takes that technology and use it. So this is really complicated. And why, uh, as South Africans, we also need to think about what sort of politicians do we need to have in order for, for them to navigate us uh, in this complex, a situation that is evolving right in front of us. Thank you for that. And then I'm going to throw this, this one to Charmaine. Uh, this is a question from Ria Gile Muloko asking, greetings, do you not think fourth industrial revolution will increase class inequality in Africa, seeing that it should really be bridging the gap, which is an echo of the previous question. Um, but I'll also give some space to you, Charmaine. You spoke about the resistance to this uh, e-hailing app by women the need for and your priorities in your career and the, on the inclusion of women who I think one can consider an underclass in some respects in Africa, as well as the income inequality. So please, by all means, address this from the Africa. So I think what's, what's also quite interesting for me is how this epidemic has actually highlighted, I think, so many of the inequalities with race and gender. And I think, again, coming back to something as simple as the ability to work from home or school from home, we saw the inequalities already being exacerbated simply because of the inability to access um, you know, technology, the inability to have data to be able to log on. Again, that um, you know, many, um, there, were, there were not enough guidelines that came through around zero rating educational sites. Um, you know, so that certain um, of, of, of our students who could actually study from home didn't need data to actually study on board. And I think while you're finding that um, I think online platforms like Khan Academy, Harvard, and so many others, even UJ, um, that are making so much educational content online um, much more freely available. They are trying to democratize education. I still do think that that whole drive around awareness and adopting and embracing digital acceleration, again, has to come from a variety of partners that need to ensure that we actually are inclusive. Um, and, and I think, again, you know, just looking at how do we ensure that we use this technology for good? Because I do believe that there are opportunities for us to use this technology for good. But I think, again, there needs to be so much more awareness of what does this mean and what are those platforms? How do we actually access them? And again, I think when we actually do access them, what purpose are we actually trying to achieve? Because I think too readily, um, you know, again, coming back to the social dilemma, I, I, I think, again, it's always highlighted simply around um, the neg negative aspects of it. But again, there's lots of good that's also coming from this use. But I do believe once again, and I think when we talk about regulating 4IR, we're not talking about actually ensuring that we put in strict rules and regulations. I think um, a couple of times now, Loazi has touched on a concept of sandboxes. So I think instead of us going out and sitting with the regulator and the policymaker and organizations and governments and sitting in closed doors um, and debating what should happen, we should actually set up, I think, AI centers where we can actually start putting in sandboxes and we can put in guidelines around how this technology and how humanity, how corporates and governments work together instead of putting a fast and hard regulation that has to go through 20 different legs of parliament to finally be authorized. So I think when we're also touching on the regulatory aspects, it's not necessarily 
necessarily having it go through those stages, but I think formalizing and making a bit more looser arrangements to ensure that when somebody puts out a e-hailing cab, there are certain rules of engagement that actually should be clearly defined and communicated so that we don't feel as though we own a certain sector, we own a certain business and no one else is allowed to actually participate in it. Thanks so much for that. All right, so I think the, the prevailing <laughs> takeaway I have from today's discussion is that we need at least seven more uh, in different hubs of, of focus, be it education, be it inequality, uh, be it the development of regulation, as you rightly say, in these various sandboxes. Um, I am, unfortunately, we are out of time. Uh, and so we are going to have to close off. I just want to thank you uh, all three for your incredible contributions, both from your careers and your passions uh, to this discussion about what actually is quite a broad topic if we just say fourth industrial revolution tech or innovation there's so much more nuance and detail to it um and thank you all watching at home and in your offices for your questions your challenging questions uh, you will be able to uh, i think pick up a recording of this someone was asking uh, but again in order of alphabetic of, of or at least in alphabetical order Ms. Charmaine Huve, senior director for africa at cisco thank you very much for your contribution Professor Chilidzi Marwala, the Vice Chancellor of University of Johannesburg, thank you so much. And of course, Ms. Loazi, Loazi Wali, Head of Ventures for uh, Founders Factory, thank you so much for your excellent uh, contributions, both academically as well as experientially. Um, and uh, thank you all for joining us today. I just want to thank the Oliver and Adelaide Tambo Foundation for hosting this wonderful event. Um, it's so important that we uh, have these. Uh, particular discussions. Uh, ABSA Group for the support. ABSA is pa passionate about playing a shaping role in society and by being an active force for good. Uh, they are privileged that uh, through partnerships that like with like-minded organizations such as the Oliver and Adelaide Tambo Foundations, they can foundation they can contribute toward meaningful conversations on issues of national and clearly international importance. I just want to give a little bit of housekeeping to all of you as soon as I end the session. There will be a quick survey for all of our attendees. Please do fill it out and take a few minutes to go to do so uh, before you kick off your weekends. Once again, thank you so much for joining the conversation on digital transformation, the socioeconomic benefits and unintended negative consequences. Alrighty, thank you everybody. Thank you. Okay, ciao.